week uh, on Sunday night felt like, from my perspective, that we covered a very, very important topic. Because uh, you had just done, hopefully you're there, I, I know you're at the point in this study where it becomes really challenging, you know, as to whether you want to give up and go into Tyler or not, but I, I hope tonight's an encouragement to you to, to, to continue being faithful. But you've been doing uh, back-to-back uh, weeks on the subject of, of hearing from God. And so I tried to do last week a little message, a simple message, to just try to explain to you what it really means to hear God. And the awesome thing is that God speaks, and He speaks in a variety of ways, okay? And the good thing to know is God doesn't change. So, you know, He's speaking here this way. Man, He can still speak that way today. And so the important thing for us to do is to listen to what God is saying. And so... Tonight, I want to encourage you by kind of taking some time and focusing on the operation of grace in our lives that has brought us to the point to be able to experience God. Okay? Are y'all with me? So somebody repeat back to me what I just said. I'm going to treat y'all like little kids like I do in the morning. I tell them something, and I'm like, all right, now what did I just say? And then they look at me like, oh, you better repeat that again. All right, I am going to repeat it again. Uh, I want to talk to you about how grace works to bring us to this point in in, in ability to experience God. You got that? Because I don't want you to be lost. Is that we're not accomplishing anything here if uh, you kind of get lost in uh, in what I'm going to say. So I think this will really in, uh, encourage you, okay? So, first of all, let me remind you about what the Bible says about humans, okay? And the uh, Bible doesn't have a whole lot to say good about us to a degree. If you study that, now just study it. You may say, oh, that's kind of weird for you to say it. But honestly, spiritually speaking, Bible doesn't have a whole lot of good to say about us. Matter of fact, Paul says that uh, there's none good, no, not one. Paul says there's none who's seeking after God, no, not one. Bible says we're all like sheep who have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way. Paul, I talked about this last week as we kind of looked at how you know, you and I are able to, again, kind of hear from God and that we have been made alive. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but because of the supernatural power of God, He has made us alive spiritually, okay? I'm sure I didn't get saved till I was in my early 20s, and so I can remember very vividly of what it means to walk around a spiritually dead person, Okay? Some of you may can relate, but I just didn't care about God. I didn't care what God had to say. I didn't care about experiencing God. Uh, All I wanted was things that put me in the spotlight or or things that made me feel good or or things that made me look good and so forth and so on. So I remember what those days were were like. So so the Bible doesn't say a whole lot good about humanity apart from Jesus Christ. Right? Dead, lost, not good. Uh, not seeking after God, lost sheep, turned to their own way. So that's what the Bible says, but God, amen? It's one of my favorite things about Ephesians chapter 2 is, you know, Paul describes very vividly life apart from Christ, but then he says, but God, right? I mean, we can talk about a whole lot of things that have gone on in our past and maybe even going on today, but God. You know, and because of his great love, he has made us alive, even though we were dead in our in our trespasses. And so, so in spite of the human condition, enters grace, the grace of God to us. Even though humanity is a mess, God wants to make a difference. Okay? And even though things were not going good in the life of Israel. I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30 real quick, and I want to read a verse to you, okay? Matter of fact, Deuteronomy chapter 28, God puts it very plain, very clear. If you obey me, I will bless you. If you do not obey me, I will curse you, okay? It's it's very clear. 
But the reality is the people of God did not obey him. And so they incurred a curse upon themselves. And, uh, of course, God knew all this was going to take place. It wasn't uh, an accident to him. And matter of fact, as you read Deuteronomy, it's interesting what God does. He's like, okay, if you obey me, I'll bless you. If you disobey me, I'll curse you. And then he goes on to say, but you are going to disobey me. But in spite of your disobedience, I, I'm going to act in grace to you. And he promises something here in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, that you and I have had the opportunity today in this time to experience. He says this, And the Lord your God is going to circumcise your heart. Now he's speaking of the future, okay? Speaking of the future. And he says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. And so what's, what's going to be the result of God performing this spiritual operation on the heart of circumcision? What is going to be the result? Well, you're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and you're going to live, right? That's what it says. So in spite of you, okay, in spite of your spiritual condition, and you're, in spite of you wondering, God's going to do something where it really matters. And that is in the heart. He's going to perform this spiritual operation. Now let's go, let's fast forward to the book of, 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 of Romans real quick. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 2. I got in a conversation with my buddy Derek Jones uh, today. And uh, he was uh, discussing uh, the new heart. And we were going back and forth through text. And that's tough for me. And, but I'm getting better at that thing. You know what I'm saying? I'm just getting really quick with my fingers and everything. So some of you ought to try it. It's good for you. Um, but anyway, uh, we got to talking about, we ended up on the new heart, uh, the circumcision of the heart. And, uh, of course, we didn't get to talk very much uh, about that particular issue because uh, he's actually preaching tonight uh, over at uh, uh, Hopewell Methodist Church. So, um, anyway, but uh, Romans chapter two, verse twenty-nine. Okay, verse twenty-nine, uh, twenty-eight and twenty-nine. Let's read both verses. It says, "For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly." And circum, circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So Paul, who had an Old Testament Bible and all, he's, he's picked up on this idea. God's given him revelation about what he was talking about way back in Deuteronomy chapter 30, the circumcision of the heart. Now jump over to Colossians. <coughs> Colossians chapter 2. Let's read a couple verses that, that speak of this. Colossians chapter number 2, I mean, yeah, chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. It says, In him, that is Christ, you were also circumcised. Circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Okay? He's not talking about a physical act here. He's talking about a spiritual act. So in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, 
having wiped out the handwriting requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he's taken it completely out of the way. In other words, the very thing, the very things, all right, the uncircumcision of the heart, the uncircumcision of the heart, the, the fact that we're spiritually dead, unresponsive to the things of God, the fact that sin is standing in the way, all of these things, Paul is telling us that God has dealt with it and removed it. All these issues that we face, all these struggles, God has dealt with it so that you and I can get to this point of experiencing Him. Talking about what we're talking about today. Or what you guys have been studying for the last, I think, five, six weeks. Okay? So, now think about this whole idea of circumcision with me for example. You, you guys understand the whole physical aspect. I'm not going through that uh, with you. Surely you understand all that. But you think about this. Paul was talking about the fact that just because you were outwardly, physically circumcised, it didn't mean that you were necessarily a part of the people of God. It wasn't just the physical act, okay? Not just going through a ritual or some sort of tradition that makes you a part of the family of God. That's why the church has got to be careful because so many people in the past, they, they associate their... They're coming to Christ with walking an aisle, praying a prayer, and going through the, the act of baptism. And so it's nothing wrong with necessarily associating your salvation with those things, but, but when you begin to talk to people, it almost sounds like it, that they're telling you that now that they've walked through those, they've jumped through those hoops, they're saved because they've done that. And we're not saved because of anything that we do other than believing and receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. We have nothing to boast about. Okay? So... Paul speaks of this circumcision that takes place that is apart from human hands. In other words, this is an act that only God could perform. And so what did he do on our heart? What did he do? Well, you go back to Deuteronomy 30 and you talk about what he said he was going to do. He was going to circumcise the heart so that we would what? So that we would love him. So that we would love with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So that we could experience the greatest desire that God has for us. So here we are on our own. We're unable to, to fulfill that. But grace has come in, right? The operation of grace in our hearts, the circumcision without hands, has done something in our heart to do what? To cause us to love Him. To cause us to desire to seek Him now. To help us have peace with the fact that we now know what the true way is. We're not out here wondering anymore. We know Jesus is the way. <laughs> Just follow him. Follow the light, right? Just go after him. We know the way. So all those things God has changed and he's given us this new heart. He's cut away, he's cut away the part, that hardness there toward God. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense to me. Because again, I remember very vividly those days when honestly, Excuse my language, but I did not give a rip what God wanted for my life. I didn't care. I didn't care. So, but all that's changed. Why does it change? Well, God's telling me the reason it's changed because he's done a supernatural work in my heart. So remember when we started, I'm trying to explain to you how that grace has operated and worked in such a way that you right now can experience God. Because he's given you a new heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. So who deserves the praise? Who deserves the honor? Who deserves the glory? It's not me. It's God. Amen. Right? So, the Bible teaches we have a heart now that has changed towards God. Matter of fact, Paul kind of, for me, I understand it this way. He says, all right, Christian, walk in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay? See, now there's a choice in the matter. Whereas an unbeliever, there really was no choice, honestly. I mean, you could choose between good and bad, but you weren't choosing between the spirit and flesh. Does that make sense? Because the spirit wasn't there. You weren't alive. You, you, just, you could choose between good and bad, but not the spirit. But now there's a choice. Spirit's leading you here. The, the flesh is trying to take you backwards, and they're contrary to one another, Paul says, and that's why at times you don't do the things you desire. But there's a choice. There now is an awakening to God. So the new heart 
leads to what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He refers to a new creation. So a new heart leads to a new creation. And as a new creation, we get to experience what, what, what God had promised through Moses hundreds of years in the past where he said, when I circumcise your heart, you're going to love me, and now you're going to be able to experience life. Because where do we find life? We find life in a relationship with him. That's what I talked about this morning. I, I preached the message out of 1 Samuel. I talked a little bit about it a few weeks back in Sunday school, and so I worked on it and developed it. And so my main message was to try to help people understand that, you know what, we're always trying to find something better in life, right? Better this, better that, better place, better all kinds of things, right? Never satisfied with this, always looking for something better. And the sad thing about the world is you can always find something better. But you and I as Christians are privileged to be able to talk about the fact that there really is something better that is unmatched. And that's Jesus. Right? And so when you go out here and you try to find something better, you know, you're here and you say, well, ah, that looks better. You go chasing after. Well, when you get there, guess what's going to happen? There'll be something better. And so that life is always frustrating. It always leads to really nowhere but misery and frustration. So that all can end with Jesus, right? So we have a new heart. As we have a new heart, we are a new creature. We're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new as we experience this new life with a new desire for him and for his ways, his will in our life. So this allows us to experience God. So I just want to remind you that to be able to experience God, that all originates in the grace of God. You realize that, don't you? I mean, that's something to be excited about. Now, turn the corner from here, okay? Turn the corner from here on the issue of, okay, now how do I experience God? Well, that's why you have this study in your hand. That's why you have ultimately the Bible in your hand. And we are blessed to have people in our lives, whether it's Henry Blackaby or whoever, that come alongside of us and help us learn what it means and what it looks like to experience God. And I had an opportunity today to talk to two gentlemen that I graduated with. And right now, both of those men are just really lost. Both of them have just recently gone through divorces and their, their lives are turned upside down. And they both told me, they said, look, man, you could not have preached a better message for me. I needed to hear that because I was talking about how you and I can smile in the presence of our enemies. Whatever those enemies are, we can smile in their presence if we choose to put our joy in him instead of our circumstances, or relationships, or things of this world. Because when you... When you base your joy on the attitude of your boss this week, then guess what? You may have a stinking rotten day tomorrow. Because your boss may come in and his attitude may absolutely stink. Right? So if you anchor your joy to the attitude of your boss, then, man, your, your joy could be up or down tomorrow. I mean, if you, you know, for me as a parent, sometimes my kids drive me nuts, you know? I don't mean that in a negative way, but sometimes they just get on your nerves. I'm sure you as parents, you probably don't ever experience that, but uh, I do experience that at times, you know? So, uh, but if I base my joy on that, that, that's where I'm going to anchor my joy on how my kids respond to me or how they act today. And you know what? I, I, I may just be ticked off all day long, you know? <laughs> but see, the beauty is I don't have to anchor my joy to those things. I can actually anchor my joy to something that never changes. And that's Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And if you truly anchor your joy to something that never changes, then guess what? Your joy don't have to change. So, it's important at this point, when I know it's a challenge and a struggle for us to press on as we seek God to try to understand what this really means. But what I want to challenge you with is the reality that it's worth it worth it, y'all. I mean, there's more to the Christian life than just showing up at church Sunday morning, Sunday nights, and Wednesday nights. Do you realize that? There's so much more. Matter of fact, I, I, if I, I wouldn't care if we met one time a week for one hour a week. 
I, it wouldn't matter to me. Because no matter how long we meet here, it's not going to negate the fact that we have hours literally in the world, in the lives of people, where God's working. You see? So, I encourage you with that. Be thankful for the grace of God, the operation of God, that leads us to a new life to experience God. And all of us are at different places in this journey, right? And I think the reason I brought up those two gentlemen is that it was really frustrating to talk to them today. Because honestly, it seemed like they were not listening to a single thing I said. Okay? And I feel like looking back, I listened well. And usually I don't listen well, you know, because I'm always trying to say something and talk and all these different things, you know. But I felt like I listened well. And I felt like with just a few sentences, I was able to try to point them back to their greatest need. I know you're talking about your divorce. I know you're upset about how your kids are feeling and how you're going to do this and how you're going to do that. And one of my buddies, his, his ex-wife, goes to that church and he's trying to figure out, you know, is he going to go to that church with the kids? You just see what I'm saying? It's just so much stuff going on. And I'm like, man, the solution for you is not to try to figure it all out. It's just to walk with God. You know, and then we got into this whole issue of, man, he just doesn't feel worthy to walk with God. And then I'm just like, man, I really want to preach then, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> but I felt like I, you know, sometimes I can literally be like a, like trying to drink water from a fire hydrant, honestly. I know that. Talking so much. But, you know, just try to put it out there. But that, that's the thing. All of us are at different places. And we try to meet them where they are. I try to meet you where you are tonight. And I just want to say, hey, keep pressing on. Don't give up. Don't give up. I don't care how old you are. Uh, it doesn't matter how young you are. You know, we get the opportunity because of grace to experience to experience God. And so here's 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 what I want to kind of finish tonight with. I want to encourage you with grace. I want you to think about those things. But now, new heart, new creation, new life. What from here? Well. If you've got your book handy, for those of you that do, I, I want to just point you back to something real quick. Let's see if I can find. It's actually on the back page, at the back of your book, actually. And, and there's a list of seven truths that basically Henry Blackaby builds this entire study of experiencing God on, okay? So the very first one is this. It is the fact that God is always at work around you. Okay? It's the fact that God is always at work around you. So what does that tell us about experiencing Him? Opportunities everywhere, right? Not just here. Not just in this building. But everywhere. At work. With your family. The places you visit on a regular basis, but God is at work. Now, where is he working? In people. In people. Y'all listen, I, I am a people person. I, I don't know what God has for me this week, but I'm telling you right now, I am going to spend lots of time with people. I'm going to do it. It's going to be on the telephone. It, it's going to be at the office. It's going to be... Uh, maybe over breakfast, it's going to be at lunch, it, it's going to be in a variety of ways, but I'm going to spend time with people. Now ask me why I'm going to spend time with people. That's where God's working. Now you guys, two or three weeks ago, you did the study on trying to understand where God's at work. And one of the things that Blackaby did is he reminded you of the things, like for example, let's just let's look at it if you got your book there. Talking about God's work. Let me find the page and you can you can look at it. Page 83. Page number 83. It's okay if you don't have this either. I'll, I'll read through some of them. But everything has to do here with people with God working in the lives of people and you know what guys here's here's the point too 
If you want to truly learn to experience God, then engaging people, connecting with people has got to be a part of your life. You with me? And, and I know that's not easy sometimes. You know, somebody says, well, I'm not a people person. Well, what I've found is that as God, again, he changes your heart, circumcision of the heart, he removes away all that hardness that was hard towards God. He gives you a desire for God. He gives you a desire for His ways. And so what I've found in my life is that God can make you a people person. Is that He can stir your heart so much and excite you so much with the truth of His grace that it literally will compel you to be a people person. I mean literally because you just can't, you just can't not talk about it. And for a long time I had no clue about that. But the honesty about my life is there was a time in my life when I wasn't pouring grace in. And when you don't pour grace in, and when all you pour in is the law and the do's and the don'ts, then depending on what you pour in is what's going to come out. And so, as we live our lives, and as we allow God to do what He desires to do, and that's to develop a relationship, you guys have spent a lot of time as Blackaby has talked about developing a love relationship with God. We can't bypass that, okay? He literally wants to take this new creation, okay, that is now with new desires for him and all those things, and now he wants to retrain your mind. And he wants to transform you through that, according to Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. Renew your mind, right? Transform you through the renewing of your mind. Train you now. Now, can't you remember when you first became a Christian? And how, man, you know, it was just like a light switch went on. And all of a sudden, man, it's like, man, I want to know this. I want to hear this. I want to figure this out. I want to understand this. I want to know how this works. And you're asking a million questions and so forth and so on. And so, but that's God developing the relationship. And sometimes we don't take time. And even as churches, we got to be careful. Because we're quick to shove people in a committee or a class or all these different places to shove them to get busy without really coming alongside of them and helping them develop a love relationship with God. Because if we can help them develop a love relationship with God, all that work and stuff will take care of itself. Amen? Amen. It really will. I believe that with all my heart. So when we walk with God, we're not going to miss the will of God. But it's really hard to walk with God when you got people all the time trying to point you around, or do this, do that, this is what you're supposed to do. No, man, people need people to come alongside and say, hey, let me help you develop this intimacy with God. So that's very important. And then out of that, People can learn how to walk with God. And I feel like that out of that is where we find ourselves in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, 2, where Paul says, it is now your reasonable service. I mean, the most logical act of worship for you, Paul says in Romans 12, 1 now, in light of the grace that God has shown you is to now turn your life back over to Him. In other words, as, as Isaiah did, he said, Lord, here am I, send me. Right? Here am I, send me. That's, that's where God wants to lead you to do. Now, on page 83, we're reminded or educated on the fact of things that only God can do. Only God can draw people to Himself. No one comes to the Father, Jesus said, unless God draws them. It is God who stirs a man's heart to seek Him because otherwise... As Paul says, well, God says through Paul, there is none who seeks him, no, not one. It is God, according to 1 Corinthians 2, that enables us to understand spiritual truth. It is God who convicts the world about sin, about righteousness and judgment, all these things. But all these things are taking place inside of who? Of a person, right? And that's where God's at work. And these are things that only God can do so what ultimately is God wanting to get us to the place yes where we'll say here am I send me and as those servants that we as it says God is working all around us that we as his servants every day that we live will be looking watching focusing on trying to see what God is doing in this world we're reminded several times over and over again that Jesus Christ the perfect example of the Christian life he did not initiate things on his own. But what he did is what he saw the Father doing. And as you learn, God revealing things to you is God's invitation to be a part of that. 
I mean, he's showing you something. He's showing you where he's working. Whether it's somebody in your family, whether it's somebody at work. I mean, you're hearing them talk about spiritual things. I mean, when you hear somebody talking about spiritual things, you know God's at work there. Because that's not happening on their own. And so is God just showing you that just so you can say, well, hmm, that guy's asking spiritual questions. No. God's showing you that. And while he's showing you that, he's giving you the invitation to be a part of it. Well, okay, God, what's next? So he's leading us to the point where we will be in tune to where he's working, looking for God doing what only he can do in the lives of people, watching for his activity. And you know what? As we engage people, and he's given us examples on page 84 of ways that we can sort of probe people to kind of find out what's going on in their lives. You can't do that without a connection, though. You can't do that without a connection. You're not going to be able to ask somebody any questions unless you're willing to somehow sit down with them or to make time to do that. And there are certain things that we can ask to kind of find out, sort of probe with people what's going on and what God may be doing in their, their uh, life at the time. There's a, there's a neat story, and I wanted to I actually send it out to the, uh, the preschool board, and I, I wanted them to see this this past week, but it's uh, on page 80. Some of you may remember it, and for those of you that don't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you. But it's, it's along this line of, 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 of learning to see where God's at work and working where God is, is at work. And here's what he says. He says, our church, church sensed that God wanted us to start new churches all across central and western Canada. Hundreds of towns and villages needed a church. Some churches would start with a population study or a survey. And then they would tabulate the results and apply human logic to decide where the most promising, productive places might be. Instead, we tried to find out what God was already doing around us. We believed He would show us where He was at work. And that, and that, re and that revelation would be our invitation to join Him. We began praying and watching to see what God would do next to answer our prayers. Allen was a small town 40 miles from Saskatoon that had never had a Protestant church. It desperately needed one. One of our members felt led to conduct a vacation Bible school for the children in Allen. We said, let's find out if God is at work here. At the end of the week of vacation Bible school, we had held a parents' night. We said to the group, we believe God may want us to establish a church in this town. If any of you would like to begin a regular Bible study group and be a part of a new church, would you come forward? From the back of the hall came a woman who was weeping. She said, I have prayed for 30 years that a church would be started in this town, and you are the first people to respond. Right behind her came an elderly man, deeply moved. He was also weeping. He said, for years I was active in a church. Then I turned to alcohol. Four and a half years ago, I came back to the Lord. I promised God that I would pray that I would pray four or five hours every day until God brought a church to our town. You are the first people to respond. We didn't have to take a survey. God had just shown us where he was at work. That was our invitation to join him. We went back and joyfully shared with our church what God was doing. The congregation immediately voted to start a new church in Allen. The congregation eventually helped establish several other congregations in surrounding towns. God hasn't, and this is how he summarizes it, God hasn't told us to go and do what we can. He has instructed us that he is already at work bringing a lost world to himself. If we will adjust our lives to him in a love relationship, he will show us where he is at work. That revelation is his invitation for us to become involved in what he is doing. Then, when we join him, he will complete his work through us. Amen? Amen? You see, it's kind of weird for me because I came from, and I'm not really trying to knock my seminary, but, but uh, the whole church planning thing, the church growth movement was going on real big when I was in seminary. And so I would have classes where literally they would tell you about how to go take surveys and how to do all this stuff. and all, you know, Basically how to sit down and logically make all this happen. And so needless to say, I was not, in my opinion, trained very well on how to truly experience God. And you say, well, <clears throat> what's the deal there? Well, I have a big problem personally 
when somebody is trying to tell me to do something and then Jesus did it a totally different way, okay? I just have a big problem with that. Because Jesus didn't work that way. He said, look, I work where I see my father work. Okay? That's what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to focus on him and those things that he shows me. That's the stuff that I am going to involve myself in. So, with all of that being said, I want to ask you something. Where are you seeing God work? Just think about it. Think about it. Where are you seeing God work? And I guess if you can't really figure it out and you don't know right now, I guess the next logical question is, are you looking for it? Are you, are you looking to try to see and understand what God is really doing in this world? Because if you are, if you will be willing to do that as his child, Bible says he's going to show you. And the Bible teaches that as he shows us these things, if I want to adjust my life and trust him, that as a result of trusting and allowing him to use me for his purposes, I'm going to experience him doing something that only he can do. So where do you see God working? <coughs> Is he working in your family's lives? Is he working in your children's lives? Or are you even watching to see if he's working mm -hmm. in your kids' lives? And some of us, we get so busy in life, we're, we're not even paying attention to what God's doing there. We don't even stop to sit down and even talk and have a conversation with our kids to even find out maybe what God's doing in their life. I mean, there was somebody in this congregation who was willing to take the time and money and effort and all those things to go actually do a Bible school in this town to just see they could see. I mean, because the whole point is you're never going to see God's work unless you're engaged with those people. I mean, it's going to be really hard to see God at work when you know, my only relationship with somebody is going to be throwing up my head at them as I pass by them every day. So where is God at work? Are you looking for Maybe you're in a situation right now where God's showing you something. But yet you're just not willing to adjust and trust Him in it. Because, hey, he's, as He's proven in the past, when He reveals things that He's doing, what's the truth about it? It's things that, that only He can do, right? So it forces you into that position where you got to say, Okay, Lord, I'm going to have to trust you to make it happen. But that's beauty and the joy and the life of Christianity, y'all. It's not coming here on Sunday morning and having a great worship service with great song. And that, man, that's great to do that, isn't it? Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of countries that can't do that. They just can't do it. I mean, they don't have the ability. I mean, they don't have sound systems. They, they don't have instruments, for goodness sake. I mean, several of those churches in Africa, and they don't even have instruments. I mean, so they're just gathering together and they're singing what they know or whatever a cappella or beating on a drum or whatever. You know, having a worship service and coming together and hearing a message, I mean, that's great that we can do that. I mean, that's awesome. But listen, y'all, that's not the beginning and the end of the Christian life. I mean, how many of us, when we leave tonight, our heart is going to be, God, I'm going to keep my eyes open. Because I know you're working in people's lives and here are some things that I know only you can do so I'm going to be watching. I'm going to be looking. Because I'm excited about the fact that because of your grace, you have given me the opportunity to experience you. And I'm going to tell you, that's what keeps me going every day. Is that it ain't about me. It's not about my ability to figure things out because I'll be honest with you, I, I feel like a failure in a lot of those areas. <laughs> I, mean, I don't feel like I'm the greatest Created, most creative person in the world. But honestly, when I think about the fact that it's God there and God is the initiator and this is His work and He's willing to invite me into it, man, I'm telling you, those truths excite me every day of my life. 
And to not only that, but, but to know that he's already got it planned out. That if he's going to use me in this a year from now, then you know what he's going to do from now till that time? He's going to prepare me for whatever that is. So I don't have to, I don't have to say, uh, I, I can't do this, I can't do that. No, I, I can really count on God. To me, man, that's exciting. And to think of the reality that it's all a result of his grace, his operation of grace in my heart to change it, to make me a new creature, and to offer me this glorious new life. Amen? Amen. Okay. Father, thank you for another day again. Lord, thank you for this life that you offer, that you extend. Lord, I, my prayer is that we would never feel like there's something better in this world. You are God. You're the initiator. This is, this is really all this is about you. I mean, it's all about you. And Lord, I, I just, it's, I know how easy it is to get distracted. And, and before you know it, our eyes are off of you and our eyes are off of what you're doing in the world. And uh, you know what, God? When we lose sight of you and we lose sight of what you're desiring to do through us, then God, it can be very discouraging. So, God, I thank you. I thank you for what you've been doing in my heart. Lord, just sort of reteaching me, retraining me, bringing me back to the excitement of the Christian life, Lord. And so I, I pray that, that, that this time will motivate, inspire, compel us to go deeper with you. That it will compel us, Lord, to, to keep our eyes open. God, to, to, to know that you are willing to show us all things because you love us. That you're willing to show us your work and invite us to be a part and to prepare us and train us for that. Lord, it is unbelievable. God, may we never trade that opportunity for anything. Lord, I'm grateful for what we can do here as a church and come together and have a great worship service. The one we had this morning was awesome. Music was awesome. The Lord's Supper was awesome. It was just good all the way around, and I am so grateful for that. And I'm grateful for the opportunity that we have to come back and train each other and encourage and teach and all that, God. But nonetheless, Lord, all of that happens so that we can be prepared for leaving those doors in just a few minutes. God, I, I, I desire to see the world... To, to see the world just in awe of what you're doing through us. Not, not just in this building, but that as we go out and, and, and live in this world, that people would truly see us experiencing you in such a way, God, that they're just blown away. And they just, in their heart, they're just like, man, I have got to have some of that. So Lord, I thank you for everybody here tonight. Lord, we also do pray for our church family. We know that with the death of Desiree and, 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 and um, their family mourning the loss of a, of a sweet loved one. We pray for them for strength, for grace. We pray for Miss Linda. She had her surgery, Linda Laws, on, on Thursday. We just pray to prepare her heart. Pray that all of that will go as, as planned. And God, that uh, you'll just perform miracles through that and uh, restore her health to her. Lord, I, I pray. Uh, for everybody here and, and for all of our congregation, and Lord, that uh, that we are that we are somehow just renewed, revived, restored. I, I don't even know, Lord, what the full word is, but God, we need you. We need a great stirring in our hearts and lives to move us beyond these walls <coughs> to the world to where you are at work. God, we we're expectant, excited about what you're going to do through us this week as we daily. Moment by moment, yield ourselves to you as your tool, your vessel, for your work, your glory. In Jesus' name I pray.